Our next unit covers gradient analysis, and that requires two data sets. So the naming comes from environmental gradient explaining some biological response variables. But they don't need to be environmental gradients explaining biological data. There can be any two types of data sets where you would like to establish associations between them. And what we cover here is uh, direct and indi indirect gradient analysis. So this means uh, that you start with an ordination just like we've done before, and then you add a second set of vectors based on your second data set. Or uh, there are actually also techniques that specifically look for associations between uh, two sets of data. So that's canonical correlation analysis, and redundancy analysis. So those are both classical rotation-based techniques. And then there are uh, distance-based equivalents. So we have canonical correspondence analysis and distance-based redundancy analysis. And there's actually others as well uh, that we cover next week, but uh, we'll start with those. So let's uh, start by taking a look at our toolbox where we are in terms of objectives and broad classification of techniques. This column is something that we haven't covered before. So the objective of gradient analysis is to understand relationships between two multivariate data sets. And this is an equivalent to univariate correlation analysis. I can use correlation analysis to look for associations. And regression analysis does predictions, right? So I also have a multivariate version of predictions, and that, that will cover next week. And as I just mentioned, we have a number of techniques that uh, are rotation-based and that are distance-based. So we cover all of those in this unit. Um, some of them we already know very well, like principal component analysis and metric or non-metric multidimensional scaling. Um, so it's a, equivalent to a correlation and regression problem. So if I have an x and a y variable, I can plot y over x. So this is my dependent variable or response variable and x is my predictor. And in just the same way, I can formulate a multivariate problem with multiple variables. So I may have multiple climate variables and multiple response variables, community data, environmental data, but it can be any kind of pairs of variables that are predictor and response variables. And again, I like to look at associations. So I'm asking, are there any statistically significant associations among my x's and my y's? Or I can also do predictions. Uh, so predictions actually are not usually done in this setting. So I don't have multiple predictor variables and multiple response variables. So we can look at associations that way, but not at predictions. So in predictions, you generally want to be more specific. So you always have multiple predictor variables, but you're interested in predicting a specific response variable. So one at a time. So it's a, it's more of a univariate problem just by the nature of prediction. So you don't simultaneously want to predict multiple things. You usually want to predict one response variable at a time. So when uh, looking at associations, I like to distinguish three types of gradient analyses. So there's a couple of ways that you can technically go about uh, associating multivariate predictors with multivariate response variables. I like to call them indirect, direct, and constrained. So in the indirect gradient analysis, you ordinate your response variables. So this, this could be an ordination of a species community. And then you are asking, how are my predictors associated with that ordination? Another way you can do it is to ordinate your predictor variables, or maybe a set of climate variables. So I have a multivariate ordination for climate variables, and then I look at how uh, my response variables are associated uh, with that ordination. Or I can use both variables, the predictor and the response variables, to ordinate. And so those techniques pull out just the variance that is common to both x and y. And some people also call this one direct gradient analysis and these two indirect gradient analysis. So there's a little bit of uh, variability in the terminology here. I like this one here because I like to think of all these analyses as separate. So they all do the same job, but in slightly different ways. So in, in some cases, it is actually preferable to ordinate the response variable. And in other cases, you want to ordinate the predictor variable. And I'll, I'll walk you through an example in the lab where that does matter. So technically, there's actually nothing new here, nothing that we haven't covered before. So you simply ordinate your species first. So these are the blue arrows here and uh, add a second set of vectors with your predictor variables. 
or you can start out with an ordination of your predictor variable. So those are my green vectors here. And then you add vectors for your response variables. So both work and they may give you the same results in some cases. But it is possible that you actually have structure in your environmental variables that's not reflected by the species, or you may have structure in your species that is not reflected by the environmental variables. So for example, if you have, let's say, soil types that you haven't measured strongly influencing your species frequencies, then, then you will not get the same ordinations. And the other way around, that works just the same way. So not all environmental gradients may actually be mirrored by species frequencies. So that's also very much a possibility. And we'll see examples of that uh, in the lab. So it's advisable, at least at the initial analysis phase, to always look at both of those. And then we also have the constraint gradient analysis. And I previously mentioned that when we covered rotation-based techniques. So you can think of this as separate rotations or separate ordinations of your two data sets. So I may have a multivariate data set of species frequencies, have a multivariate set of environmental variables. So here I call them soil variables. And uh, you align those two multivariate coordinate systems that, that you get the maximal correlation between those two. So this would be your first canonical correlation. And you can plot the first canonical correlation, so the first rotation for your species frequencies over that of the predictor variables. So and that allows you to make an inference that you know soil variables 1, 4, and 7 are strongly associated with high frequencies in species 3, 4, and 9, for example. So all those constrained techniques, they specifically look for covariance among your two data sets. So if you have structure in your soil variables or structure in your species frequencies that's not reflected by the other one, uh, they will be completely ignored. So you'll see none of this. So just doing constraint analysis, I also strongly advise you against it because you never know that you missed something important. Uh, so I would always actually do all three of those and uh, to draw my conclusions of what's going on. And depending on what you find and what's interesting, you can then selectively pick a technique that best represents the relationships in your data. Uh, so this up here, this was an example for canonical correlation analysis. So that maximizes the correlation coefficients. Redundancy analysis, uh, the classical redundancy analysis is actually almost identical to this. It maximizes a variance explained, so the R square. It should be the same thing, but it's not quite uh, identical, uh, but it's very close, so it doesn't really matter which one of those you use. And then you have distance-based versions uh, for this as well. So you're working with distance-based ordinations, and there we have the canonical correspondence analysis and the distance-based redundancy analysis. Now you can also do statistical tests for those associations. And the principle is actually not dissimilar to a linear model, so you have to observe the same kind of assumptions. You don't really have any requirements for your predictor variable, so those can be intervals. So I can have a bunch of points at 10, 20, and 30 units of my predictor variable, so they don't need to be randomly sampled necessarily. Those can, in fact, even be class variables. So if I have soil types as my predictor variables, uh, they could be classes, and that would make the linear model equivalent to an analysis of variance with multiple levels. And so both of those are possible. And my response variable should be normal for any combination of predictor variables. So again, the same as in the linear regression. So for any combination of either continuous or class predictor variables, that distribution here, that, uh, that should be normal. So some techniques technically also assume linearity between your predictor and response variable. But um, in, in practice, I don't think you have to worry about it all that much. So it's more of a question what kind of effects can be detected. Uh, so if, if you don't have a linear relationship between your species and your, uh, and your predictor variable, so if this is more like a curvilinear distribution one way or the other, but still detectable as a linear association in all gradient analyses that we cover. Um, but what's undetectable? These are the hump shape uh, distributions or unimodal distributions. And these are actually quite common. Uh, so if you have an environmental gradient, uh, oftentimes you have a situation where it's, I don't know, too cold for the species or hot, too hot for the species, but at some intermediate value, the growth or the frequency is maximal. And uh, th so those types of relationships are actually uh, problematic. These are undetectable by any of the techniques. So even if it says otherwise, uh, that is not true and you can test it yourself. So in the lab, I provide some data sets where you can 
uh, try out if techniques can detect these kind of relationships. Uh, so if they're complete symmetrical unimodal distributions, there's nothing you can see. And if you think about an ordination, let's say we do a species ordination here. Uh, so the triangles and the circles, so they're both low and species three, and my, my maximal frequency is uh, up here. So if I were to ordinate this, it would plot out like this, right? So my triangles and my circles uh, go into one corner and the uh, stars here where I have the highest frequency go into another and my uh, vector would point toward the stars. So now try to fit an environmental vector into this plot. So that does, just does not work, right? So, so at the same time you want to point away and towards this group here with your environmental vector. Uh, so that's actually not possible. So it would just stick out here in the middle as non-correlated. So there are other options for gradient analysis that beautifully handle these unimodal relationships and we cover those next week. But these ones here won't work. So how do we report results from a direct or indirect gradient analysis? I would just show the plots with two sets of vectors. And sometimes what people do is they actually show the errors for one set of vectors that you used for the ordination, and they don't show the other set of vectors. So the second set of vectors, you just put the labels where the tips of these vectors would be. But if you want, nothing uh, should stop you from actually putting those vectors in. So you can definitely do this as well. Uh, there's no harm here in adding a second set of, of vectors as well. You can report the variance explained and the significance of the association also in a, a separate table. Um, canonical correlation analysis is reported a little bit differently, so you don't have a plot for this. So you're just looking at the common loadings. So what we're interested here essentially are the vector loadings of your original variables with your uh, canonical correlation coefficients. So if, we, if you recall, uh, I basically have two cubes that are rotated into position, so the points within those two data sets are maximally correlated. And then I can look at how the original variables correlate to those canonical correlation components. So if I have a double data table of correlations here, the way this is interpreted is that my first canonical correlation has an R square of 0.82. Uh, it's highly significant. And the original variables that are correlated to this is at environmental variable one, and that is associated with high frequencies of species one and two. And my second canonical correlation, still significant, uh, explains a little bit less variation that represents an ordination between my species three and my environmental predictor variables two and three. And these could certainly also be negative. So I might have a situation where I have a minus 91, so that would mean species 3 is particularly frequent if my environmental variable 3 has low values and environmental variable 2 has high values. And then canonical correspondence analysis. Uh, you can report both uh, the variance explained by each of your predictor variables and you can have an ordination as well. So this one is uh, similar to the ordinations that we covered before, but it would only consider structure that is common to both variable sets. So any kind of similarities in your sample points is, is, that is unique to the climate variables or that's unique to the species variables, those won't be used uh, in this ordination. This is an ordination based on the, the covariance between the two data sets. So just like an analysis of variance, you can have a mix of both uh, continuous and class uh, variables as your predictors. And uh, let's say our en environmental three variable is a soil variable, that's a class variable. So we have pot soils and other classes uh, of soils. So instead of having one vector, this is, gets actually broken out into classes. So what that means is that, let's say species four and species three are associated with um, the pot soils and the species two here um, is associated with some other soil types. So besides the ordination in canonical correspondence analysis, you can actually uh, report something that's uh, equivalent to an ANOVA table. So you have each of your predictor variables of my environmental three predictor variable actually has three classes. So that would be N minus one, uh, two degrees of freedom, just like uh, in ANOVA. So it does give you an equivalent of sums of squares and you can calculate the variance explained by each of those uh, predictor variables, as well as the residual and uh, you can report p-values, so uh, very similar to an ANOVA in terms of reporting. 
And then last but not least, we have redundancy analysis. So again, rather than looking at correlations, I'm looking at variance explained. You can also report that in a table. So how much of the variance in your species data set is explained by each of your uh, predictor variables. And uh, so you can actually further break that down, uh, which is interesting in a commonality analysis. Uh, so you can create these Venn diagrams that ask how much variance explain is explained by each predictor variable. But if your environmental predictor variables are correlated with each other, they will also have a proportion. Some of some of the variance will be explained by both. So you have variance that's uniquely explained by each variable. So this would be 2%, 14, and 7. So no other variable explains this portion of the variance. Um, then you have variance that's in common between two pairs of variables. So those would be autocorrelations between uh, pairs of variables. And then in the center, you would have uh, the proportion of variance that's actually covered by all three variables and a residual uh, that's explained by none of the uh, variables. So you can break this further down. Uh, this can be quite informative. I like this. Uh, the only disadvantage is that this commonality analysis is usually restricted to uh, three or four variables that you have to consciously pick, but it is a nice visualization what proportion of the variance is explained by each variable individually and in commonality. So with that, uh, I'll let you get started on the lab. So before you watch the next video, uh, just work your way through the lab. And in a follow up video, we'll go over some of the results. So I will actually walk you through the different types of analyses here um, after you've done them yourself and thought about them yourself.